everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Psych Monologues. We are a week away. I said last week that stress is intensifying, and now stress is on steroids, and worse than ever. Uh, everybody's frantic about getting their Christmas shopping done, <coughs> or started, as in my case. Um, besides all the other things that we have to do and parties and people to see and everything else that I normally like to askew, uh, new word for your vocabulary today, in other words, stay away from, I, uh, this Christmas season tends to bring out in me the cranky old man syndrome, uh, you know, that, that, uh, and, and there's good reason, I'm, I'm probably going to well, I am going to take, probably, I am going to take some time to talk about it tonight. But let me get it introduced. If you're new here and wondering who I am and what this is all about, you're listening to the Psych Monologues. It's a podcast that's devoted to exploring the intersection of faith, psychology, and spiritual formation. And those things oftentimes don't go together in people's minds a lot. Uh, and so what, we, what I want to do is take some time to um, not look at each individually, but look at the, at the interaction of those things uh, that faith and psychology have a lot to do with us, um, <clears throat> particularly our psychology. And I, a lot of people I come into contact with, whether it's Christ followers or people that are just devoted to psychology, there's a lot of ambivalent feelings about this interaction between faith and psychology. And somehow, some of the, the perspective on it is that if you introduce faith into it, then it's no longer objective. Well, psychology, in a lot of ways, is not objective because of the subject of our study, namely humans. And humans have this unique ability that the minute you look at them or examine things about them, they hide. And I don't think a cell does that in biology. I don't think chemistry, chemicals change when you start looking at them under a microscope or playing with them and, and uh, getting them to explode with one another, whatever. And then spiritual formation, which oftentimes people like to talk a lot about, particularly in the Christian community, we love to rhapsodize about spiritual formation. But we do little or nothing with it, really. I mean, we just, we just expect it just to happen. We really don't see it as something that I need to participate in. Sometimes I, it's a, I, I understand that that's a broad brushstroke, but still, all, all in all, the Psych Monologues very much is an expression from an organization called Stained Glass International, uh, and I refer to it as, as SGI, and the mission is to equip, encourage, and empower the next generation of Christians to live authentically in relationship to, to Jesus and others and themselves. And oftentimes you hear the most about Jesus and others, but you don't hear very much about how do we live authentically with ourselves. And there's a lot that we do to hide ourselves from ourselves, which is an even, even bigger topic that we can talk about at a later point in time. But what we're seeking to accomplish and to develop is what I call outposts for the heart and communities for the soul, a safe place for us to be known as we are, not as we should be, and the opportunity for us to allow other people to do that too. And it's hard. It really is, honestly, very hard to find a place like that. A lot of times you, you get saddled with a leader that, that sees their leadership as, as a sermon, um, a pulpit, rather than a, a leader that is committed to developing community. And developing what I, like I said, the outpost for the heart. I call it an outpost because in a lot of cases we're living in, in a larger community that doesn't value that stuff. And so this then actually does become an outpost. So pull up a chair, get comfortable, relax. Thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate you taking some time out of your intense stress. I hope that I won't make it worse as I talk about this. But I want to talk about the issues that have come to my attention that I hope matter to you about where you live and who, what you think about and how you feel about living life with others and ultimately with Jesus. I mean, this is, this is Christmas, right? And 
Jesus, I, I won't say the trite phrases that they make me want to throw up because it, it, it just cheapens the thing in my mind. It just makes it superficial. So I'm not going to say that. But the fact of the matter is that God loved us so much that he paid all of the price. I mean, it literally, as I've said oftentimes to my students before, is that God said, I recognize that they can't get to me. They can't have this uh, intimate relationship with me. So I'm going to send me, you, Jesus, down into their world and bring them to me. And that's, that's a remarkable thing. It's an it's a incredible act of love, given what he did and what he went through. But it's a little bit like you and I going to the local pigsty, sitting down and having a conversation with, with the, the pigs there in the slop. And it, that would be the equivalent because we were told Jesus came to us from paradise. So all that being said, that's kind of the backdrop to what we're doing. I, I wanted to start out with something kind of humorous. <clears throat> it comes from a, uh, a parody uh email that I get from a place called Babylon B. And uh, the title tonight, what I want to talk about is that we always hear and we hear all of the kind of syrupy, sweet kind of um, songs and stuff about home for the holidays and all that kind of jazz. And this, this is kind of the backdrop because what I entitled the episode to be t- tonight is not home for the holidays. And what does that actually mean for us? And who is it that we're talking about? So 2,000 years ago, a, young, a little young couple, a young family, actually wasn't home for the holidays. They were forced to go somewhere else. And so this is, like I said, this is a parody, but it's humorous. And I thought I'd, I'd share it with you just to get started. And then we'll get into it. It's Dateline Nazareth. And it goes this way. According to those close to Joseph and Mary, prominent OBGYN Dr. Zacchaeus of Nazareth pulled Joseph aside after Mary's latest checkup to tell him hauling his pregnant wife to Bethlehem Bethlehem on the back of a donkey was kind of a bad idea. And he said, listen, Joe, I know the census is important, but a donkey? Dr. Zacchaeus was overheard asking Mary's weary husband, She's going to pop any second, brother. I know you've been through a lot lately. People talk. But the last thing you need is to be stuck in Bethlehem during tax season when life takes an irreversible course, if you know what I mean. So Joseph was reported to have sighed, thanked the good doctor for his advice, adding that really there was no pleasant way to get a nine-month pregnant woman from Nazareth to Bethlehem even with the technological advancements like wheels, which he couldn't afford anyway. Dr. Zacchaeus agreed with a sigh, wishing Joseph and Mary a safe and uneventful journey. At publishing time, Dr. Zacchaeus of Nazareth had reportedly just poured a glass of wine to enjoy on his back porch when he noticed an unusually bright star shining over Bethlehem. You see... Before Jesus was even born, he wasn't home for the holidays. I mean, his home was in heaven with God, but he goes somewhere else for the holidays, namely the holiday to honor him. And Mary and Joseph weren't either. Nazareth was their hometown. They went to Bethlehem instead. I mean, this is a story that touches all of us. We all do this. We go home. We go somewhere, right? Right? Sometimes for the holidays. Sometimes we go places just to avoid home. But the thing that I want to focus on tonight is the one thing that seems to not be talked about, and it's in the background, and it's a very painful background. And it's what I would refer to as the sting of absence. This year in my family has been a really, really tough year. We have lost two significant people, not lost, they died. We've had two significant, one significant person and one very significant member of our family die. And we're feeling the sting 
of the absence as the holidays approach. I certainly do. I certainly do. And it brings a string of memories, of feelings that come with it, everything that comes with it. And most of it is a re-emergence um, of the feelings around grief. And ironically, I'm here talking about this. And see, this is the thing that we, we experience the most poignantly because of their absence for the things that they would have loved the most. And so the backdrop to this is my father-in-law, who for all intents and purposes was my father, my dad, died in July. And we, it, it, it more or less just blew out the rest of the summer before my wife and I headed off to school to do our thing as teachers and so forth. And then only about a month and a half later, we said goodbye to our 16-year-old golden retriever. Now, granted, that is ancient of days for a golden retriever. 16 years old is really, really old. And the vet that came to, uh, that, that came to euthanize Coda said that, said so much. He said, I, I don't think I've ever seen a golden this old. And in both of their cases, Paul, Paul Williams was his name, still is. <laughs> Paul and Coda both used, as the phrase goes, used all of the runway. They ran the race. They ran it to the very end. And so grief seems to bring this slight, uh, kind of veiled pall to put over holidays oftentimes for those who are experiencing it for the first time and even those who are experiencing it many times over. It still has a sting to it. It's not the same as the original one, <clears throat> the pain, the agony, <clears throat> the sense of loss, the sense of confusion, all of that is very much a part of the holidays. And, and when I said that oftentimes holidays are not my favorite time of year, I, I, I tend to get very introspective and reflective and maybe melancholy <clears throat> at all the memories thinking back. And by the time you get to my age, you've had some losses, significant deaths, and they all seem to congeal and form and coalesce into the holidays. <clears throat> and so I, you know, I, I recognize that it, it oftentimes shows itself as what would appear me as, as isolating or withdrawing, but it really is just allowing myself the, the space to feel it. And, and, and the thing is, we don't we don't learn very much about grief in our in our culture today even in the christian culture which is really ironic how much time do you spend or have you heard a pastor spend talking about lament for example lament which is is a song of grief and so what i thought i would do in, in light of that and and Granted, I know that people will hear what I'm talking about and tune out. It's like, I don't need this. I don't need the sadness. I don't need, this is just dragging me down, quote unquote. And the thing is, and, and I'd say this even before you just sign off, all right, if you're thinking about doing that, is that I, I have seen before things that say grief occupies the place that love first was. And so grief may not be what we have come to believe it to be because we are so oftentimes committed to a life of ease and peace and happiness and comfort and anything uncomfortable we remove from that. 
And grief is one of those things. And the irony is, is we all experience it in one form or another. And so I, I would say, hang with me for a minute, because grief is intimately connected with life. We think grief is intimately connected with death. But I would put to you that it is connected to life. And some of that life is about our life, not the life of the other person, the person we've lost. It is about their life and how they touched us. But it's about our life. And how much of our time will be spent resisting and restraining and denying and de de dismissing the feelings we have around it. And I would say that 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 allowing those feelings to exist actually makes joy that much more profound. It makes the connection with people around us that much more profound. Now, granted, there will be plenty of people that say, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, don't, I'm, I, I just don't want it. And that's okay. That's fine. See ya. But I would encourage listeners to, to hang with me <clears throat> because there are lots of things that are actually drive us or give us life because we're willing to have life be both conflict and connection, both joy and loss and grief, both of those things. And our lives are made up of contrasts. And if we take the contrast away, then our lives become flat. And we live only for excitement, for stimulation, for things to change, and that's it. Nothing more. And we know it's shallow. We know it's artificial. It's superficial. We know it. <clears throat> So then our challenge becomes, if we follow that path, is how many str what string of superficial excitement can I string together, and then I'll call that life. But then in our quieter moments, because sooner or later they come, in our quieter moments we're left with that. <clears throat> because I can't be constantly stimulated when I sleep. Or when I'm falling asleep, which is where some of these things show up. So this is what I want to do, <clears throat> just to give you a preview. I, I want to talk a little bit about the misconceptions around grief. And <clears throat> I talk about these because they're so significant and so contaminate our understanding of the, the profound nature of grief because grief comes from connection and connection gives us life and grief is only a reminder of life but we can't have ultimately we can't have connection without both loss and connection we can't have we, we, we get it both, right? Oftentimes what people do is say, I don't want to have any connection because then I have to live with the threat of the loss. Yeah, I get that. I get it. I get it. I've talked to people for years and years about that. And in many instances, I have been just like so many of other people out there that I say, nope, I'm out. I'm out. That's, that's fine, but it hurts too much. I'm not willing to walk into it again. I'm sorry. But sooner or later, something draws me back because we were designed for connection. And we recognize that in the depth of the risk or the threat of loss, there resides a profound connection that helps us feel, guess what? alive. And so there are some misconceptions that I want to deal with and then and then we'll we'll get to kind of kind of what probably people are waiting for. And I I'll just forewarn you. I am not giving you a steps. Eight quick steps to get over your grief. I'm not going to give that to you. So if you wait for that, I'm I'm just going to tell you up front I won't. 
But here are just a few, all right, of what we have within our, within our culture, within our interior culture, because we build an interior culture too. And the very, very first one is, is a mistaken value of restraint. In other words, I will do everything in my power to not fall apart or break down or melt down or I can't, I can't keep it all together, whatever the phrase is. And somehow we've gotten it drilled into us that that is the best way to go in terms of handling loss and, and grief. And the very thing, the thing that it does is it steals from us the opportunity to honor the profound connection we had. And I I can go a long time in talking about my relationship with my father-in-law. I can go a long time. We had a long history. It was, it was, uh, let's see, it was at least 70 years, at least I was I was in my 20s when I met Paul and Paul died at 95. So that's pretty much the math, right? 3 quarters of a century. And I have stories to tell and he would have stories to tell if he were here, which would be fascinating to listen to. <clears throat> but all of those stories are the very fabric of my relationship with him. So Pressing all of that down and hiding it for what? So that others don't feel uncomfortable? Probably. Probably. In a lot of cases, our restraint is mostly for other people. It's not for us. It really isn't. It's for other people because we don't want them to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to be a rain, rain on your parade. I don't want to be a downer. I don't want to drag you down. And suddenly our sense of over-responsibility for things we can't control, I might add, steals from us the opportunity to honor something that was profoundly impactful and influential in our lives. So we've gotten this mistaken idea of, I've got to hold it all together, if you will. And, and the interesting thing about that is the conversations I've had with people, and they say, I'm sorry. The minute they start crying, they say, I'm sorry. And I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I, I've heard these phrases for as long as I've been a counselor, which is well over 40 years. It's like, I'm falling apart. And oftentimes when we allow ourselves to be whole enough to feel what it is we feel at the moment that it occurs, we're not falling apart. We're actually falling together. We're actually rejoining the parts of ourselves that we have fragmented for safety's sake. And so this mistaken value of restraint robs us of the opportunity to honor the very thing that has impacted our lives and probably continues to impact our lives. It does mine because in a lot of cases, my in-laws were more parents to me than my parents were. One was gone and the other was incapable. And so the mistaken value of restraint. The second one is, is there is a fear that lurks back in the inner resources of our unconscious or whatever you want to call it. There's a fear that if I let that monster out, it will consume me and it will bowl me over and I will never recover. So there's this fear that if I let it show then I won't recover. I won't ever be the same. I won't be functional anymore. I won't be seen seen as having it all together. Whatever, whatever it is. But see, the, the fear of grief, this is the funny thing about fear. It's a little bit like being a little kid when the light in your window shows in just the right way and your clothes are piled on, your, on a, a, a chair in your room or whatever and you're sure it is a monster to get you. And the fear 
consumes us, and it does with grief too. Because we don't see it as a friend. We don't see it as something that is a fundamental part of being human. It is not something to be fixed. It is something to be followed. And so it, it, we're afraid that if I let it out, if I let it be seen, I will never recover. I won't, I'll be falling apart for the rest of my life. Which brings me to the third thing that I just referred to a minute ago in the mistaken value of restraint, and that is the misunderstanding of tears. And like I said, I've said, I have had this happen, and I've gotten to the point, even for myself, that that's the case. Is if you, if, t- if you show tears, or if you cry, what is the first emotion you have? It isn't what what generates the tears it is oftentimes shame and feeling guilty for impacting the other person or letting your your pain be seen and so what do we do we we preemptively (laughs) this is cool this is interesting we preemptively apologize for what they might feel by seeing our tears and so tears show and reflexively we say i'm sorry i'm sorry but sorry for what sorry for loving the person that so much that you can't hold the tears back is that really what we're sorry for Or is it sorry because suddenly we've gotten more responsible for the other person than for our own, for for being true to our own hearts? And uh, choosing whatever the circumstances, sometimes we can't choose it, which is again irritating and embarrassing because there's no allowance for us to. to, for us to lose our crap around people because suddenly. They get afraid, and I'm responsible now for their fear. And this this becomes a snowball. It just runs rampant through our relationship with people. And you see that. If you've ever been to a wake or a memorial service or anything like that, and sometimes you end up seeing the mourners taking care of the people that come to pay their respects or to give their condolences. And there's good reasons for that. And I'm not going to go into all the details around that. I mean, the reality is, is if I spend more time taking care of someone else, then I don't have to deal with the things that I'm feeling. And that's, we, we all have these propensities to do that. I, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. All I can say is, me too. I've been down that road before myself. And I've gotten to the point that, and this this is from the the genesis of the psych monologues, which was a grief and loss class. And the one thing I I say early on in the class, and then I repeat all the way through, is I refuse to apologize for my tears. I can apologize for hurting somebody, but my tears are hurting aren't hurting anybody. If anything, they're a profound display of how much I love somebody. I mean, just the other day, I was, <clears throat> I was, well, actually it was this morning in church and I was, we were doing a worship set and I was standing there listening and, and I suddenly began to remember and think back to Christmas time with Coda, my golden retriever. And, you know, he was my one male ally for a long time. I lived in a house full of women. I have four daughters and my wife. The cats were even female. So it was like, I'm literally a wash in a sea of estrogen. And Coda was my one ally. We were the two testosterone outposts in the family. And we hung together and, and we, we did that. He, and literally if I, if he were here, he'd be, He'd be laying down here on the floor by me while I do this podcast. And if I got intense at all, which I've gotten a little intense over the last 15, 20 minutes, he'd look up and say, 
what's up, dude? What are you doing? <laughs> and that was comforting to me, and tears came to my eyes. Why wouldn't they be? I, I love that dog. And he was my companion for really, really tough times in our family. And for me, too. Not just my family, but for me. So we have this misunderstanding. I might even get stronger and say there's a condemnation of tears because we're not supposed to fall apart. We're always supposed to have it together. May I remind you that if you go into Scripture, there was a culture-wide acceptance of wailing and tears. It would make us really uncomfortable in you know, our emotionally uptight Western world and tears were were respected. They were valued. And it's fascinating to me that we're told, and probably and most people know this, even if they don't know very much of the Bible, the shortest verse in the Bible, right? Jesus wept. <laughs> tears. Tears. Put it in context. He was overcome by the pain of his friends with his friend Lazarus dying and his sisters being having a mix of fury because they knew who he was as the son of God and he they were saying to him the very thing that we say if you are such a wonderful God then you could have saved my brother from dying and in my mind's eye and this is just distorted world Mitch world in my mind's eye I can see Martha running up to Jesus forcefully poking her finger in his chest and saying, if you had been here, he wouldn't be dead. And then she adds a but and says, yeah, but I know who you are and I trust your heart, which is what we get disconnected from. We get disconnected from it, but we don't miss the fact that Jesus wept. Did he know what was going to happen? I think we can make a pretty good guess that he did. So he didn't pat him on the head and say, don't worry, don't worry. I've got it under control. Everything will be fine. No, he didn't. At that moment in time, he wept. And I would think their, de their grief was even deeper seeing his sorrow over his friend. And there's, there's a distinct mixture of grief and anger in there. Because that's exactly why he was coming. So that we didn't have to experience the, the, the eternal disconnection from God and death. He came so that this wouldn't be the last sentence of our story. So let me, let me do two more. <clears throat> if you truly love somebody, then you're never finished with your grief. And we've got to have an understanding that the grief, and I, one writer actually calls it, it's, a, it's like a psychological burn wound. Now, if you've ever had you know, your finger burned on the stove or something like that, it's remarkable how much pain that, can, that one finger can be in the middle of the night, wake you up, right? But eventually, the, the wound heals. And grief is connected to the healing of our wound. Do we forget? No, we don't. Memories persist. We were designed to remember. So, and, and just think, think about it this way. Any scar on your body carries a story with it, right? Any scar. And, and I just saw a, a video clip where they, the, the, the people that were in the clip were comparing scars and telling the story of what that, those scars meant. The scars were healed. It wasn't something that still hurt, but it carried memory with it. And so I can be finished with the healing, otherwise known as grief, and my testimony of my love is my memory of them. And memories are 
the most precious thing God has given us. Now, we, we condemn our memories oftentimes because we, there are things we'd rather not remember. But at the same time, everything about us is contained in memory. Everything about our relationship to people you love is, part, is driven by memory. Everything about your relationship with God is built on memory. Oftentimes you ask people about their relationship with God and what will they tell you? They will tell you from memory the things where he stepped up and did something miraculous or he has continued to walk with them through a very difficult season. And so it, it, our memories are obviously a mixed bag as humans, but at the same time, our memories are the very thing that allow the person to occupy that space in our heart. And then the last one, which kind of goes with this one, is that grief can never be finished. That's just fundamentally not true. But at the same time, we're still left with a scar, are we not? But the wound can be healed. And it doesn't mean we're losing the person. It feels like it. It feels like if I let the memories, quote-unquote, the memories go, then somehow I, I, will, I will lose them. And that's, that's, the, that's the mixed bag, if you will, about grief, is going through the process of grief. We've already, what prompts the beginning of grief is a loss. And what kind of sums it up at the end is the admission of a loss. And so it feels like losing again. But the loss by this time is very different. Because then it becomes a letting go rather than being ripped away from the person and feeling like I've been separated and I can't do anything about it. So there are misconceptions and these poison the pool of our ability. And, and it shows oftentimes even the things, the larger pictures of how we manage our emotions, how we manage our, our relationships, how we see them. But it, grief, and I think in a lot of ways, that's why people have such misgivings and avoidance of grief because it reveals so many other things. See, our grief reveals us. And that's part of it. So now <clears throat> let me pause for a second. And somebody out there will say, okay, so what? Now that I know all this wonderful stuff, which I really didn't want to hear, but now I got it. So what's to be done? <laughs> and like I said at the beginning, I'm not going to give you eight quick steps for recovering from grief. There are there There is a perspective I would propose that helps you participate in the process. And there, there's a way to do that. But this, the point of this podcast is the absence, the sting of absence of the people in our lives that are not here for the holidays that, we, that were so precious to us. So what's to be done? <laughs> well, the first one you're going to hate. Most people do. Because what's to be done is nothing. Our grief is fundamentally tied up with our humanity. And trying to deny it or diminish it or dismiss it or distort it may serve us in terms of trying to control it, but in so doing, we've denied our own humanity and our connection to people. Grief is normal. Just like the, the nerves on the tip of your finger when you burn it and they throb it's normal we don't say well that something's wrong and cut the tip of our finger off but in the emotional world and in in the world that i'm talking about we see it as there's something fundamentally wrong and there's nothing to be done is maybe this season this time around allow it to exist now it's going to exist whether you give it allowance or not but allow it to be there and uh, as, as awful as it sounds some people would say embrace but I'd say get to know your grief allow it in a sense and this is this is kind of a, a, a deep into the counseling strategy now but 
Allow it to speak to you. What is it speaking to you about? Your relationship with the person or maybe your general relationships with people in general that was connected up in that. Whatever. There's nothing to be done. It's part of being human. It's nothing to be fixed. Now, to move farther into it, and again, I'm not inviting people to ruin their holidays here, because it doesn't have to be the whole day. It doesn't have to be the whole Christmas season. But we're literally, think about it, this Christmas we are remembering the beginning of a life that ended in torture and cruelty that was a massive sign of unconditional uh, ravishing grace and love for us. So, take some time to remember. I mean, some would say lean into it. (laughs) And one way to do that is, is to talk to someone you trust. Now, I, the one, the only caveat and the only warning I have is you are not going to make somebody trustworthy by trusting them. This person has to have a record, a history with you that shows that they are willing to listen and not try to fix your grief with some platitude or some, some Bible verse they need to share with you. No, they're willing to listen to your stories. And I, I, I'm not diminishing the, the intersection of God's word with our, our experiences. I'm not diminishing that. But the one thing we know is that we're told to, to um, set a defense, if you will, or speak in season with the person that we're talking to. In other words, make my comments to them according to their need, not my need to sound profound. I put it very simply, and that's presence over profundity. People need your presence when they're grieving. And when you talk to somebody, they should have a record, a history that says, I'm willing to listen. I'm not going to try to fix it. And maybe this person has been down this road before and they know the importance of just talking and reminiscing and looking back and things look different after a year of time. And another thing, which if you don't necessarily have somebody who's willing to listen, is to pull out an old journal or go to Walgreens and buy a 99 cent, well, they're probably not 99 cents anymore, a buck 50 notebook and write down the things you remember. Again, we can reminisce in a lot of different ways. You can, uh, you know, we, we walk around, which is absolutely stunning. But we walk around with the equivalent of 10 photo albums in our back pocket. In, in the photo albums of our phones. So look at pictures. <laughs> Maybe listen to music that you might have associated with the person. I can tell you the days after we said goodbye to Coda, the days after I sought out to listen to music that was about dogs. It sounds quaint or trite or whatever you might call it. I don't really care what you call it. But it was my way of giving space for the grief that I felt. And it helped. <clears throat> it really helped. I mean, I've told a lot of people this. And I, I think I may have even mentioned it in the episode when I was talking about learning from a dog. We we have a new golden retriever. Her name's Cherry. I'm, she and I are still trying to work out the details of our relationship. Because she's a six-year-old. And she's got other history. And she brings her own history with her. But... I went out and I started watching the movie because I'd read the book before is A Dog's Purpose. And I I have said that in one of my groups (laughs) this fall after it happened. And I mentioned that movie and everybody said, I can't do that. I I just can't do that. And the funny thing about it was I would have been one of those people 
four months before. As a matter of fact, I often will avoid movies that something happens to an animal in it. I, I, it, it is a special kind of pain to me. I don't know about anybody else, but to me, that's really how it goes. So I, in, in grief world, in, in doing grief work, looking at pictures and listening to music are often what are called scrubbing the wound, uh, allowing the wound to heal. And, and the writer that I'm referring to that they called a psychological burn wound made the parallel that when, when we had burn victims, a lot of times we have to keep the, the skin that has been damaged by the burn uh, available to the air because if scabs form over it, then bacteria builds up and it kills the person. So in days gone by, before we had artificial skin and, and the variety of kind of fabrics and things that we put on a burn victim to, to kind of be able to treat the wound but not have it be exposed to the air, because, of course, that hurts too, they would, they would give the person uh, high doses of Demerol and painkillers, and they'd plunge them into a whirlpool and scrub the wound because it was the only way to keep them alive. Now, today, we're beyond that with technology and things like that. But it, it, it's a vivid picture because in our grief, we have to allow the wound to weep. <laughs> and you've seen it. Our, our bodily system, the lymphatic system, shows up and you see the wound weeping. And <laughs> we don't think anything about that, but we condemn ourselves for weeping ourselves, right? So what's to be done is to don't try to fix it. Admit that it's there. Allow some time to feel it. And then look to the next thing. The next relationship, the activities and festivities that we're heading into, minus the stress and all that. Yeah, I get it. But living life, Grief adds a depth that we would never otherwise experience in life without it. And so life takes on greater meaning, greater profundity, greater impact when we understand that it's temporary. It's not going to last. And so either I make the most of what I have or I say, I don't want it to hurt so bad when I get to the end, so I'm going to diminish it now. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and I'll, I'll end on this quote, but Eliz Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, everybody knows her. We've used stages over and over again, which I just, between you, me, and the hedge post fence, I hate, because stages tempt us into thinking l linearly, sequentially, once I get one done, I go on to the next one, and then finally I'm done. It doesn't work that way. But she made this same kind of comment, is that we live our lives as if there is no end to them. And what ends up happening is that it empties us of a sense of purpose and a sense of profundity of our relationships with one another, knowing that they will come to an end. And in the world that we live in that often is so addicted to happiness and fun and excitement and just everything being good and all of that, allowing grief to exist and the loss to be a normal part of being human, we never, we never get to experience it. Now, granted, we, sometimes we get hijacked, right? into relationships and we get swept away into them and forget about all that we're pouring in that at some point in time it will be will be separated from it but we don't think much about that that's inconvenient it's it's uncomfortable and here comes the happiness you know thing to come in and say this is how life is supposed to be is always happy always peaceful always having fun always being excited all of that. So there you have it. <clears throat> There's so much more. I, I obviously have spent a lot of time thinking about this and, 
and uh, talking about it with people, I think it's probably one of the most important topics ever when it comes to our relationships, really. Because we miss things, and then, you know, oftentimes when things, when, when the person is gone, or we don't have access to them anymore, or they die, or the relationship falls apart, what do we remember? And it's not the, the good times, because we've always looked for good times rather than having, having and I say this in air quotes, good and bad times. Because getting through conflict draws us closer. It doesn't drive us apart if we can do conflict right and well. I shouldn't say right. But be that as it may, something to consider. I think it's really important I think we feel it most painfully during these holiday seasons, and that's why I wanted to take some time to talk about it. You know, Jesus' life was punctuated with loss. You know, his cousin was was beheaded. <clears throat> One of the most gruesome things to think about. And, he, and crucifixion was not new to him. He walked by it all the time in the Roman Empire. That's how they publicly humiliated and killed a person was through that torture. So it wasn't new to him. And, and I, I would just end on this, is that he was characterized as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And isn't that remarkable? That we, have, we, we are the only religion that has a God that understands grief like we do and we experience it as humans so with that i will draw to a close that's it for tonight thanks so much for joining me I, it has been a pleasure and a privilege to have some of your time to talk about some really important stuff i think so at the end of every episode, I always mention these things, and I hope it doesn't get too boring, but I want to make sure that it's in front of, in the forefront of your own mind. If you have questions or I've said something that doesn't make sense or you want to know some more information about it, um, you DM me with a question on Instagram. You can email me at dr.mitch, M-I-T-S-C-H, at drmitch.com. Um, you can you can leave a comment on the website at drmitch.com. So there are a variety of ways to, to open the conversation or to ask the questions or to have a comment that you have about something I may have said. We've added a new feature on the website where you're able to subscribe, and that way you can be notified when any new content is uh, shows up on the website, whether it's a new blog post or a new podcast entry or any new content that you might be interested in, there are there's going to be some developments this year. This is a, a year, now that it's all kind of coalesced into SGI and, and uh, um, Psych Monologues is one of those things, but there's a lot of other resources and things coming that you want to keep an eye out for. So I encourage you to subscribe on the website. It's, it's one of those annoying pop-up windows, which I know we all just love to death but it is a way to stay up with any new content and it will be coming and there will be opportunities for uh, other content that you might be interested in so you can also follow us on three social media outlets instagram at the psych monologues uh, facebook ray.mitch and some of these are going to change since we now have sgi um, they, we will probably establish a, a separate page for each. LinkedIn, Dr. Mitch, that probably will always be that. Um, and if you're, if you like to, and something I've said that you like, you'd like to hear more of, you'd like to go back and listen, please subscribe on any of the platforms that you use to consume or listen to podcasts. That includes Spotify and iTunes and Amazon Music. Anywhere that podcasts are, you're going to find us there at the Psych Monologues. And so you can do that. Um, and then, last but not least, if you want to partner with us, we are ever so grateful for your willingness to consider that. We're coming up on the end of the year. If you're considering where to send 
Um, so uh, donations, we are now a 501c3 uh, tax de- uh, tax exempt organization. So you can have a tax deductible gift given to us. And there are two big visions that you can you can support. One is the scholarship fund for students to participate in the silent retreats that we sponsor and I conduct with with a uh, co uh, spiritual director, or the vision of of um, SGI, the vision of developing outposts for the heart in a variety of contexts that can be universities, that can be Churches and homes, it can be anywhere, but either one of those, you can choose on the on the payment page, you can choose which one you want to give to, and we will faithfully devote those funds to, to whatever is necessary. In the spring, in this spring of 23, we have two silent retreats coming up, and students, it's, it's not cheap, it's expensive for a student, and so uh, exactly... Uh, $330 buys a complete retreat for the student who to participate, okay? Uh, we have alumni that come from CCU, and we have students, active students of CCU. So uh, there is a intense need there as well. So you can find it on any of the donation buttons in on the website at drmitch.com. And it will take you to a payment page, and you can choose what to give and how much to give. And and even if you want to subscribe and support us for the entire year, again, we would be immensely grateful. If you'd rather send us a physical check, you can do that as well. Make your check out to Stained Glass International. The address is SGI, P.O. Box 160, East Lake, Colorado, 80614. So... Uh, if you would rather send a check for accounting purposes or whatever, feel free to do that. We're not going to turn our nose up at that either. But we have, we have, you know, there's, there's, it, it, there's a cost for running a nonprofit, for doing the retreats, for doing the podcast, and experimenting with new ways that we can find to to connect with people. And so we would be ever so grateful if you were to send that to us. Um, at at Stained Glass International and uh, the address in East Lake, Colorado. So, I think that's it. I I packed in a lot. <clears throat> I'm pushing an hour, which is really overstaying my welcome. Um, but thanks for so much for joining me. Join me again in a week. I've got another one that I look forward to spending some time talking about. And until that time, love ya. Later, bye.